and believed the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left the nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. And so here we see the, the call of the first disciples who would become apostles, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And so the Lord is now recruiting his labor force. Jesus came to the earth to recruit a labor force. That's why he came. He came to recruit a labor force of disciples that would assist him in bringing in the harvest of souls that would hear and believe the gospel. That's why in Matthew chapter 9, at the end of that chapter, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, it's plenteous. The fields are white to harvest. He said, don't wait, don't say waiting. Several months from now, there'll be a harvest. He said that the fields are already white for harvest. So the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray you, therefore, to the Lord that he might send forth laborers in to his harvest. And so Christ came to recruit a labor force. And so he begins the recruitment here in Mark chapter 1. Now, at the end of the Lord's ministry, he gave to the disciples, and it also is handed down to us the Great Commission. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize men and women, boys and girls, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which symbolizes their interest into the kingdom of God, and then teach them to observe all things, whatever the Lord has taught us in the Bible. You know that by heart. And so we've come to only interpret that verse from the perspective of we got to send missionaries to Africa and to the remote parts of the Congo, and we got to send people geographically to places where the gospel has not yet been preached so that those people can hear the gospel and believe and some will be saved. And that is an accurate interpretation of the Great Commission. But it's only part of the interpretation. Because Jesus, he didn't go anywhere. He did not leave the nation of Israel. His entire ministry, as a matter of fact, almost his entire life, for except for a couple of, of years after his birth, when the angel instructed Joseph to flee with the baby and Mary into Egypt until Herod had died, Jesus spent his entire life in Israel, and he spent most of his life in a place, a remote, rural, unsophisticated, uncouth place called Nazareth of Galilee, in which nobody respected. And he spent much of his ministry there until they kicked him out of town, then he went to Capernaum, and he spent the rest of his ministry there, and then he made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He didn't go very far at all. But what you see, beginning in this text, you see the strategy of Jesus of Nazareth, and you see the genius of Jesus of Nazareth in terms of how he would win a labor force and how that labor force then would win other souls to Christ. And what he does, he penetrates the spheres, the system of the world in which he lived in. Are you following? Not only do we have to go geographically to foreign nations, because those in foreign places who've never heard the gospel deserve to hear it at least one time and our opportunity to respond to it. But we have a responsibility in our own Jerusalem, our own hometown, our own home city, to penetrate every sphere of influence and win people to Christ and then disciple them so they can win other people to Christ in that context. So the first thing Jesus does is he penetrates the commercial world. One of the major occupations in Galilee was fishing. It was a lake city. It was right on the lake of Galilee. And so fishing was a major occupation. And fish was a staple food that the people ate. You got to understand these were Jewish folk. They didn't eat pig. So you look at all the stuff we eat from the pig and they couldn't eat none of that. They had to replace it with something. 
And so they ate a lot of fish, and they ate lamb, and they ate goat, but fish was a major staple in the Jewish situation. Now, if you look at this text closely, don't underestimate Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were professional fishermen. The Bible says they had hired servants. They had their own boat, their own tackle, their own nets. They were pretty into this thing you call fishing. But Jesus calls them while they were engaged in their occupation. Now, in their situation, he is calling them to leave their occupation as their primary focus that they might be with him. But everything that they had learned in their prior occupation would also benefit them in this new assignment in the kingdom of God. So he says the same principles, some of the same lessons that you have learned along the Lake of Galilee, the diligence, the hard work that it takes, the time that it takes, the efforts that it takes to discharge, I'm going to now transfer that into fishing for men. Now, any professional fishermen in here? I know there's some fishermen in here and some fisherwomen in here who tell great uh, fish tales. <laughs> but fishing is hard work. I mean, you just don't go out there and throw a couple lines out in the water and eat a bologna sandwich and see if the float moves. <laughs> Now, fishing is hard work, and being a professional fisherman was extremely tedious and difficult. It was arduous work. As a matter of fact, they would fish during the night. It was the best time to fish along the Lake of Galilee because particularly during the warm months, it was so hot and humid and the water would be so warm that the fish would dive deep down in the Lake of Galilee for cooler water. And then the fish would come up toward the surface at night to feed. And so the fishermen, basically, they would fish all night and today would break the next morning. And then they would spend the early hours of the morning preparing their nets, preparing their tackle, getting ready for the night evening rendezvous, and then getting their fish to the market, and then going and taking care of some things at home, getting some sleep, and starting the process all over again. It was a major, major task to be a professional fisherman. So what Jesus does, he wants these guys to understand that. I'm calling you from being a full-time fisherman, but I'm not calling you to a life of ease. You're going to fish for men, and it's going to take the same diligence, the same commitment, the same sacrifice, and the same effort. But this is a major thing he does, because what he's doing is he's going to penetrate the commercial industry of fishing, because Peter and Andrew, James and John, they would have all the contacts, they would know who the players are, they knew the culture of the fishing arena, so they would be able to help develop the strategy for evangelizing those who are engaged in the occupation of fishing. Are y'all listening to me? That's the same thing that we've got to understand, that when God calls us out of darkness into the light, he calls us in a context of how we're currently living our lives. And most people who get saved, they normally continue in the same occupation that they had prior to salvation unless they were doing something illegal. Hopefully, they change occupations. But the fact is, your knowledge of that occupation, of that arena, it uniquely equips you and qualifies you to be the most effective fisher of men and women in that particular context. Are y'all listening to me? And some of you waste a lot of time on a lot of these social service organizations. Yeah, I'm going to say it out loud. Because if all you're there to move paper and vote yay and vote nay, you miss the whole point. Anybody can do that. But we're there to try to bring to bear God's perspective to look for opportunities and ways to connect with those people that we're serving with in that social service capacity to see if we can win some of those people to Christ. Those people who run in the organization, many of them which are not saved, who may be good folk, philanthropic, kind, generous, and will give and help people, but they still don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are erroneously assuming that their good merit is earning them some favor with God. Because most people believe that salvation is obtained by works. And most people believe that the woman with the blindfold on that symbolized justice with the balanced scales in her hand, they believe that she's up in heaven, the gate of heaven. 
and that you take all the good things they did and you put it on one side of the scale and you take all the bad things they did and put it on the other side of the scale and depending on which way the scale tilts determine 